Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. And today, we're going to be talking in uh, fairly low detail about some of the countermeasures that Iowa-class battleships had uh, over their careers. And um, I am by far no expert in this, but the interesting thing that I hope I've conveyed by the end of this video is that Iowa-class battleships carried countermeasures throughout their entire career. Um, we uh, think of World War II as the first war with radar, and that is correct, but it's incredible to me, by the end of the war, just how many radars and countermeasures had been developed. Uh, so we're going to talk about that. First, we're going to start with the 1980s, where our countermeasures are pretty obvious. I'm sitting at the Slick 32 console in the Combat Engagement Center of New Jersey, and uh, this is a contemporary system still used on Navy ships today. It can detect incoming radar signatures, it can classify what type of radar is making them, and any CEC staff member worth their salt then knows what ships or aircraft or munitions are carrying that sort of electronic package uh, so that they have an idea of what has just picked them up on radar. And it can jam that frequency. So this is something of an all-in-one, uh, which we're going to see they did not have during World War II. Uh, but jamming a thing, when you get detected by a radar, and you can tell hey, in the 1980s it's a Soviet radar, so that's probably a bad guy, uh, and you know that it is a certain type of radar, by its NATO reporting name that you've got memorized, and you know that that radar is operating at a certain um, a frequency, a certain wavelength. You can blast out an electronic signal at that same wavelength or frequency and uh, scramble the return. So now instead of this radar sending out its own beam and getting that back and being able to see what it bounces off of, well now it's just completely fuzzy with all of this stuff being uh, blown into it and uh, say it's an incoming missile, that might be enough for it to not be able to see the ship and hit it. If it is uh, an enemy ship's targeting radar or surface search radar, whatever the case may be, uh, they may not be able to see you at all because everything is now so fuzzy on their scope. So that is your active type of countermeasure. Your passive type of countermeasure is MCOM or emissions control where we're in a space that's just absolutely filled with radars, if we turn all of our radars and radio signals off, then other assets can only see us, can only figure out where we are if they turn theirs on. And then because you've got radio and radar direction finders, they see where you are, and you can trace that back and get a pretty good idea of where they are as well. As far as I know, Battleship New Jersey never had to use active countermeasures in combat, but it certainly is possible that she did and I'm just not aware of it. An example of a time when she used a passive uh, system like MCOM would have been in the 1980s when she sailed into the Sea of Oshkosh. Her and her surface action group were operating in the northern Pacific. Her surface action group turns off to the south, uh, continuing with radio chatter and playing their electronics and whatnot, having their radars running, and it looked like not only that service action group was there, but also Battleship New Jersey was there, because they kept using all of the call signs. Meanwhile, New Jersey goes completely silent and sails up into the Sea of Oshkosh, and it must have been a big frickin' surprise for that bear of reconnaissance aircraft that found the battleship in what's known as the bear's backyard, uh, because they had no idea that she had turned into uh, what the Soviet Union thought was their completely controlled and protected waterway. That created quite a uh, response, as the Reagan administration intended it to, and they scrambled all sorts of aircraft and ships to come and observe New Jersey as she sailed in that uh, sea, which was international waters. So this is the Slick 32. In the 1960s, New Jersey had a similar system called the ULQ-6B. That is the countermeasure system 
that you see uh, with all the whiskers sticking out of the O10 level of the superstructure. New Jersey is the only Iowa that got that. Uh, and next to her five inch guns being used as an anti-aircraft capacity uh, was basically the ship's only defense against missiles at that time period. New Jersey is the only Iowa that got that. Uh, and that is the reason why New Jersey has the unique T-shaped superstructure as opposed to the uh, more aerodynamic superstructure that the other Iowas get in the 1980s. So let's go look at some less sophisticated countermeasures that this ship has as we work our way back in time. So this is the Mark 36 Super Rapid Blooming Offboard Chaff Launcher. Chaff is developed during World War II and uh, essentially it's just shredded aluminum foil or as one of my coworkers calls it uh, aggressive christmas tinsel it's a mylarized aluminum that uh, is in a mortar projectile that sticks out like this and uh, there's a control panel on the bridge wing there's a control panel down in cec when ecm detects an incoming missile you try to jam it first if you can't jam it because these things are sophisticated, they can, change radio, uh, they can change radar frequencies and jump from wavelength to wavelength so that it is more difficult to jam them. As weapons are developed, new countermeasures are developed. As new countermeasures are developed, the weapons evolve. Uh, and it's not at all uncommon for the weapons to stay one step ahead of the countermeasures. So, uh, that is trying to jam and not be jammed. This uh, is our next line of defense. You push that button on the bridge and it just fires these mortars off into the air and they explode. Iowa class battleships have four sectuple mortar launchers. You notice that they're set at different uh, angles here so that they're launching a spread. We're trying to mask the radar signature of an entire 57,000 ton Iowa class battleship. That is a big radar return. So by putting a bunch of these chaff launchers in the sky and putting all of this metal up there, an incoming missile's radar goes from seeing one big metal target to hopefully seeing two big metal targets and not knowing which one to engage. This one being closer to the missile is hopefully what it will engage and the ship is supposed to fire this and then break off, uh, which works pretty effectively on a, on a uh, maneuverable destroyer less so on an Iowa-class battleship with the turning radius of a dump truck. But uh, it is a line of defense. The final line of defense is, of course, shooting the missile down. Uh, and I'm not sure if you can call it a line of defense because it's completely passive. Uh, the last step is to just tank that hit on your armor. This is the 1980s version of the chaff launcher. These uh, Mark 36s are still used today as well. During the 1960s, New Jersey was the only Iowa-class battleship to get that decade's version of a chaff launcher, which was just modifying a Zuni rocket launcher, which is an, uh, a rocket launcher fiberglass tube that can hold four rockets in it that's slung under the wings of an aircraft. Uh, the Navy knew that its ships, particularly its older ships that were still around, the heavy cruisers, the uh, frammed destroyers, the, uh, Iowa, uh, the New Jersey herself when she's brought back uh, at that time period, they have uh, no modern defenses like the modern ships. They don't have any way to shoot these down with uh, surface to air missiles. They got nothing. So they install uh, these Zuni rocket launchers on these little trainable positions and they're supposed to be someone out there who points at a target, aims, and fires. And we've got pictures that show just the hint of where these were in the amidships 40 millimeter gun tubs. We would have had uh, four of these positions. Most of the cruisers got four of these as well, but with them stacked two by two. And the cruiser Little Rock in Buffalo is, as far as I know, the only place in the world where this launcher uh, still exists. So that was the uh, earliest version of that system. Uh, same idea, but uh, kind of now if it would work. This is the later version, which is 
works well enough that it's still used today. Um, these can also be fitted with a flare launcher or flare mortar round, essentially, in case it's a heat-seeking missile coming in instead of a radar-guided missile coming in. Although that is significantly less common for ships, it's far more common for aircraft uh, with their big afterburners to be worried about heat-seeking missiles. Aircraft do also have flare and chaff as well, uh, but they don't drop from mortar tubes like these. So, we covered the modern system of countermeasures that the battleship had during the Cold War and during the uh, 1980s. The same system that is still in use by the modern Navy. However, um, the whole purpose of this video is to show you that countermeasures goes back way further than any of us think of. They go all the way back to World War II. So, first off, uh, the simplest types of countermeasures that Battleship New Jersey had during World War II were one, operating under radio silence. Uh, again, that's the early version of MCOM. And then when you start adding radars and other electronic things that transmit, shutting all that down uh, also falls under this. Next up is laying a smoke screen. There are two different ways to do this. So the first one is the simplest. You pour more oil into your boilers and now instead of getting a clear haze of smoke, you get a big black uh, smoke screen coming out of your stacks. So that is a great uh, simple way to obscure your ships. Oftentimes this is a tactic that the destroyers, which screen the fleet, will do. You don't want visual observation, visual range finding, things like this. Your destroyers can run around the outside of your fleet and lay a smoke screen, which will then block uh, any sort of visual observation. Smoke screens are no more good anymore because radar can see through it. But World War II, functionally, is the last time that uh, the U.S. Navy is fighting an opponent that doesn't heavily rely on radar. Japan had radar during World War II. They had radar countermeasures during World War II. It tended to lag about three years behind the Allied powers. While Germany had most of the European continent to rely on, the Allies had e their individual nations to rely on each other, uh, Japan was pretty isolated as an island nation, and its colonies uh, were relatively low-tech themselves, partially because the European powers that had previously colonized them kept them low-tech, um, partially because Japan couldn't, they didn't control them long enough to uh, make them high-tech themselves. Many of uh, Japan's up-and-coming scientists were drafted into the military and were not advancing scientific pursuits during the war. And, and so radar was one of several areas where Japan lagged throughout the war, despite uh, occasionally getting some information from Germany or the other Euro-Axis nations. So uh, Japan operated radar. American radar jammers were pretty good at knocking out that radar when it was used, and so Japan relied primarily on visual uh, observation. So smoke screens were still effective then, not anymore. So one type of smoke screen is making it from the smokestack. The other type is a chemical generator. Many World War II era American ships had a chemical generator at the fantail right back here where we're standing, and often uh, it looks like four cylinders, roughly yay big, uh, two next to each other and then two stacked on top of that. It would be right back here at the back of the ship, generally. Uh, because Iowa class battleships have the crane where I'm standing, and then the, the mooring chocks right here, the flagpole, I'm not entirely sure if New Jersey carried a chemical generator and where that might have been. Uh, because the fantail's pretty crowded. You, you start going out, what? well, you got the 40mm gun tubs. Um, so I'm not 100% sure if the Iowa class battleships had them. Some ships, uh, in addition to carrying their own generators, also carried generators that they could put into their small boats. And Iowa class battleships had two 26-foot motor surfboats during World War II, uh, even when all the other boats were removed because they were fire hazards. Uh, and so if this ship was, say, operating in Buckner Bay during the Okinawa campaign, um, the smoke generator 
might not spread out as much if there's not a breeze, so it's not doing as much work. Well, you put a smoke generator in your boats and your boats are just running around the ship putting up a smoke screen. And that works very well. You're obscuring the ship from aircraft overhead so, so they have a really hard time bombing her. So, there's your low-tech countermeasures. One early defensive measure was to uh, take an aircraft and put radar detection equipment on that aircraft to see, uh, and you're basically flying it over enemy held positions and its job is to ferret out the enemy radars. The enemy sees that there's this aircraft coming, it might be a bombing raid, so they turn on their radars to detect it, whether that's a fire control radar to help aim the guns, an air search radar to see how many aircraft are out there, whatever the case may be. Uh, so these aircraft are known as ferrets because they're ferreting it out, or uh, sometimes weasels or wild weasels, things like that. We, we still use this tactic today. Uh, so you detect the enemy radar positions and now you can engage it. Once you have detected the radar, there are three things you can do. One is attack that radar site directly. If you can destroy the antenna, there's no radar transmitting. Hey, uh, that is difficult with aerial bombing of land-based sites. It's practically impossible in a naval engagement. It's really hard to determine where your aircraft bomb is going to hit or where your 16-inch shell is going to hit on a target. Uh, so targeting the enemy's radar antenna specifically is not that precise. You can avoid the radar. Uh, so if you are an aircraft, this is useful. Not really if you're a battleship. Uh, you can avoid a radar if you put a mountain range between yourself and the target or say if you're flying below the height of the radar. Air search radars uh, tend to be mounted as high in the superstructure as possible to get the biggest range as possible. So if you fly below that, usually 50 feet and under, uh, you are underneath of the uh, air search radar and they just can't see you. Air search radars intentionally don't go all the way down to the deck because high waves might show up on these air search sets. So it's called flying at wave top heights. Uh, the next thing you can do is spoof the radar. That's what we're using the chaff for. So we're putting uh, strips of aluminum foil out there and now their enemy radar sees lots of returns. Uh, so that is spoofing it. Interestingly, Japan did not spoof radar as much. They knew they could do it but aluminum was such a scarce resource and so important for their aviation industry uh, that they did not make a bunch of uh, chaff to drop. So the other option is jamming, which we've already talked about. Uh, and like I said, I showed you the 1980s versions of jamming enemy radars. They did that during World War II, if you can believe that or not. Uh, so by World War II, Iowa-class battleships have radio and radar direction finders to determine where these signals are coming from. Uh, and they have something called a TDY-1 radar jammer, which is putting out an electronic signal, much like the Slick 32. And they also have other antennas associated with that uh, called Sword and Derby. And so for example, the Sword antennas are shielded from the TDY-1, and they are being used to determine if the jamming is working effectively. Uh, so that can then determine uh, they're changing their frequency to uh, operate on a different frequency since we're jamming this one. Well, okay, then let's change the frequency that we're jamming at. So World War II era electronics were incredibly, incredibly sophisticated even by 1943 when New Jersey enters the war. Over the course of the war, the types of radar that New Jersey is using, that the Allies are using, are changing, becoming more sophisticated, uh, which means that they are operating at different wavelengths because they're using different types of antennas, different powers, that, that uh, so on and so forth. And this is how Japan ends up three years behind the Allies. Uh, their jamming equipment is for early war American radars. Well, by late war, we've gone to microwave. We, we, we're using different wavelengths that those jammers and radar detectors don't work on anymore. 
uh, and, and Japan just isn't able to keep pace with their countermeasures. So did you realize how prevalent countermeasures uh, and countermeasure technology was during World War II? Let us know in the comments section down below. In the past, I've often told people that our countermeasure was the ship's armor, um, and that modern ships that don't have armor rely more heavily on countermeasures. But that's not true. Iowa-class battleships have, for their entire career, carried entire suites of low-tech and high-tech countermeasures. Which do you think is coolest? Battleship New Jersey receives operating support from the New Jersey Department of State, also from a number of other businesses and private individuals like yourselves. We really appreciate your support. There's a link in the description below if you'd like to continue donating to support the museum. You can also support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing so more people find out about the museum and our channel. Thanks for watching.